All right, welcome to Social Distillation, the submarine still of the internet, where we attempt to drop the bead and pour white lightning straight onto your brain. Today is going to be a quickie. Got to get in and get out. And we both got stuff to do. But we want to talk some fitness. We haven't talked, we haven't had, really had a a focus on fitness in a bit. Uh, so uh, let's uh, let's start with the experts. Welcome back. This is Jim BYOB. Bring your own biceps. So you had a one half night stand with a chick who thinks running five Ks is impressive. And she roasted you for having chicken legs. And then she banged the frat bro with cankles, his dad's credit card, and his dad's body. So after doing hate reps with body weight calf raises while beating off in the toilet, you decided that this year you were finally gonna take legs seriously. So it's time to brush up on your squats. Which some say is the king of leg exercises. But that's like being the president of Canada. Honestly, I don't even believe in Canada. Or a leg day for that matter. So call this bro science fiction. And to uh, so there's our there's our intro. Bro science fiction, the king of leg exercises. <laughs> oh my goodness. All right, where do I start? Uh, yeah, I, I have not watched this yet for those in the audience. Heath wanted to have my reaction i mean obviously hilarious as always uh a little less vulgar than usual so that's good uh for our podcast but at the same time uh i i, I want to see more before i make too much of a comment but it's uh <laughs> his little uh dating analysis was pretty good Although realistically, even if you don't have chicken legs, it's still the other way around too. So, yes, but don't have chicken well, legs. Well, that, we've that proven we've we've proven but with science that three three and a half inches is all it takes to uh, satisfy a woman. That's the length of a credit card. All right, let's go back to the video. <laughs> all right, this is where we start to get into the the highly detailed analysis. My hamstring, man. Might have to do this another day. Oh. Okay, now let's talk lifting gear. Wearing a lifting belt to squat anything under three plates is like wearing a condom to get a hand job. And although your squat shoes make you look like Dorothy, not even the Wizard of Oz can make your squat go up. And knee wraps aren't gonna make your knees look bigger. It's just gonna make you look like your second string at a roller derby. Lifting gear is powerlifting cosplay. It's like buying a Desert Eagle and saying it's for home defense when you live in a gated community and the closest you've come to a desert is when you misspell dessert. Let's just be honest here, man. We're both here for the same reason, to look cool. So let's just drop the weapons and do it like men. Bareback, barehanded, I mean. Raw, 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 like God intended. Gripping it from behind and just coming raw, thrusting it raw. No belts, no shoes, no clothes, just men pumping. Oh, I know what you're thinking, and yes, it is almost time to start squatting, but not yet. <laughs> Okay, next part is super important. Whatever you do, do not stretch or warm up. The longer you spend not squatting, the less likely it is that you're actually going to squat. You just saying you're going to squat today. This is true. And you don't need to warm up your legs because you're already standing on them. And you've been running out of excuses to skip leg day since 2013. While we're on the subject, dynamic stretching is bisexual stretching. Are you stretching? Are you dancing? I don't know, but I don't like it. I don't understand it. I don't know what it's about. I don't get it, and therefore it makes me angry. And now a word from us. All right, Sam. So where do you want to start there? Do you want to defend your bisexual stretching? <laughs> yes, please, for those in the audience. First of all, let's give standard disclaimers. We are not your trainer. You did not sign a waiver. This is not official advice for you personally. If you want to do something you hear on here, you are entering at your own risk. We are just for informative purposes only but yes please warm up and please stretch <laughs> uh and not static stretching but but like he said dynamic stretching realistically though you can just warm up with a general warm up like walking or something and then slowly ramp up the weight but it has to be so slowly 
that your body can adapt to it going up. So if you're only squatting, then all you have to do to warm up is variations of squat. And if you can't do a body weight squat without warm up, warm up, then you probably shouldn't be squatting with weight to begin with. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, and, and this is, I think leads right into what, what kind of got us uh, on this trail to begin with. Cause you had something from Brett Contreras you wanted to talk about, which is, you know, that this is where the personal and personal training comes from, which is why we are not your personal trainers because we don't know you. Mm -hmm. And so, so one of the things I do when I'm, I'm, evaluating someone for the first time is I teach them my kind of long form dynamic warm up and I tell them this is probably more than you will ever need to warm up but one I want to see you do these movements and see how you do them two I want you to know this and have this in your back pocket uh and three I forget the third so <laughs> but uh for most people that's well, three that's, for me is I'm evaluating how they can move to begin with. Yeah. Well, that's that's my one is I want to see them move. Um, uh, I also want them to get some work in because in an evaluation day, the, you're usually not doing any real work. Um, so I want to I want to get them sweating a little bit. But uh, so typically for like a normal person, I will use that as like a full mobility day like this is mobility day so we're doing all this stuff and then we might do you know some kind of circuit to to get the heart pumping at the end for most people you're going to need like half of that and, and this is what i generally say for most if you're gen generally healthy you're probably only going to need about half of this if you're a special population if you've got a jacked up spine you may need all of it every day just to do normal activities mm -hmm. that that's the range there is uh w where does it become personal uh another example is i don't like to do i don't like to mix in ab work in my circuit work because i've got a fairly weak core and i've got unstable lower body so i don't want to compromise my balance i don't want to compromise my posture when it comes to that lower body work, you can do it. You, you do it frequently where you, you know, for program density, let's mix in a little abs here on this thing. Mm -hmm. uh, well, and so this is where we got to separate two things in a warm up, and I don't want to get too far in the weeds because there's more to the video, right? Mm -hmm. But we, you can separate activation from working out. So if I want, to do a squat, it's actually very important that I activate my abdominal muscles and get them kind of primed for harder work. So say a one minute plank is hard for you, but you can do a 10, se 10 second plank in your warm up, which I'll usually do it with a shoulder mobility. So I'll have them get in a plank and then do up and down, back to back, side to side kind of stuff. So you can activate a muscle, but it's just know your limit. So if you're getting close to your limit on that exercise or even halfway there, you're probably wearing it out to some degree. But, you know, if you can, you know, sprint a 400 meter, well, you can probably warm up with some 10 meter sprints, right? So as long as they're suboptimal, uh, sub, sub maximal, <laughs> let me, let me bring that up. Cause a 10 meter sprint is more intense than a 400 meter sprint. But if you're getting ready for the 400, you could probably warm up with a couple 10 meter runs where you're practicing your, your takeoff, where you're practicing your foot placement and things like that. So just because it could wear you out for the long term event, uh, event, there is a, there is a price point with the warm up. Uh, now with the gear I wanted to get on, because gear is something that cracks me up all the time. Uh -huh. uh, knee sleeves are great. And uh, from anecdotal from clients that really love them, they say it makes you just feel lubricated the whole time. Your knees stay warm. So there probably is something to the temperature. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is support. Otherwise, they wouldn't use them in competition. This is the big, dirty little secret of powerlifting. These things help you lift more. They should be illegal, but they're sponsored by the companies who make them. <laughs> knee yeah. sleeves will help you squat more if you're 
if your wobbly knees are the issue, right? You can get away with a little valgus stress if you got a little extra help for your ACL because you notice they're wrapped at angles. Well, you look at a knee brace that's for patella tendonitis or or an ACL tear or something, look at the straps on them. They're at these, these crisscross angles specifically because the ACL and the PCL do this inside your knee. So that rotation is actually, that, that prevention of the rotation is actually assisting those structures, structures that can't contract on their own. So they're basically the guardrail on the road. So you just added robustness to the guardrail. So yes, these things do help, which is why I think they should be performance enhancing in these situations, which is why I love Eddie Hall, because when he pulls a, a, a record deadlift, look at him. He's not wearing a belt. The only thing he uses is straps, is, is uh, grip straps. The, the everything else anybody he competes against is all geared up in a deadlift suit a deadlift suit you have to work to get down to the bar which means it helps you pull the bar up a bench press suit you have to pull back just to pull your elbows back in a bench press suit so that means it helps spring the weight back up if you can lift if you can't lift within a couple pounds of a geared lift then you didn't lift it. I'm sorry. Mm. That's just that's just like the spotter going, it's all you, bro. But they're pulling the weight up. It's exactly the same thing. It's just inorganic. But but yeah, they do help. The back brace, I prefer to lift without one because I like to work the core when I'm lifting. But if I'm maxing someone out, obviously that's something you don't take the risk of hurting their back to see how strong mm. their legs are. So, But if you're just training, I would try to do as much as you can without it unless you have an underlying condition. But again, I'm not your trainer, so I'm not giving you specific. specific and advice, again, that's but... where the personal and personal training comes. Okay, yeah, but... <laughs> just a little bit more here. Yeah. Warm. If possible, don't use the power rack. You don't want to be caught putting the safeties on just to squat your body weight when you were 13. It's like putting on a life vest to take a bath. Trust me, you're better off just letting it kill you. All right, now let's hit the bar. Do one warm up set. Wait, pause it. <laughs> bar. So one of the rules of the weight room, everybody has to remember, is if I die under the weight, you put more weight on before you call the ambulance. <laughs> yes, otherwise it's a major gym foul. <laughs> okay, continue. Try to make your form look as good <clears throat> as possible. So anyone who sees you will think you know what you're doing. And although this looks like a warm up set, this actually counts as your first working set. Now it's time to put this leg day on your shoulders and fuck it. And then finish before it's done. Jump right to 135. One thirty-five. Oh shit. Um Babson, could you help me figure out which one is the is the forty fives? Are you serious? Yeah, um, I can't read these are these are bumper plates. I can't read European, dude. <laughs> Except they're road bumper plates, so they have pounds on them. But yeah, I can't read European. <laughs> so if you are in a place that has only bumper plates, 20 kilos, my friends, 20 kilos, which is usually yeah. the blue if they're color coded. Uh... <laughs> um, Eric Cressy uh, had a post about this a while back uh, when, when he was talking about you know, warm ups, and, and it was, you know, it, it was one of those things because he he is smart person. It was more general than was probably useful for the average person. Kind of like when I was trying to come up with solid rules, and you kept going, yeah, but you know, there can be this instance where you would. So we kept having to like regress even further to get something that was a an always rule. Uh, and, and that was kind of his point: is how come when we go in to uh when, when people go in to do the bench press they go in they slap a plate on each side they bust out 10 reps and they say okay i'm good and then they put on their working weight that, that doesn't make any sense especially if your working weight is going to be like three plates it's, what did you accomplish there you know what what you were talking about ramping up it's your your warm-up shouldn't just be uh well i'm, I'm gonna do uh, warm set with the bar because that's what you do and then i'm gonna slap a plate on each side because that's what you do and then i'm gonna put on my working weight mm -hmm. no it, it should be 
regimented in a way that works for you to build up to whatever your working weight for your sets and reps is that day. Yeah. Well, and realistically people find their happy place if they're training themselves, like I'm good with a deadlifts. I'm good with the, the standard plate quarter, plate quarter, plate quarter, plate quarter till I get to where I'm going. Mm -hmm. Uh, but with bench press, it's a little bit, of course, I'm not doing a whole lot of heavy bench press right now, but okay, what we'll do, I'm doing single arm bench, uh, bench press right now. And I have to start really low because I'm really trying to feel out how that tendon is, is, is holding up. And so I'll start at 50 for 12, then 60 for 10, then 70 for eight. And then I'll go up in eights until I feel like I'm getting to where I'm. And right now I'm going to a max effort all out at 90 pounds, which is right now eight reps for me on the injured side, 15 on the uninjured side. And when they match, then I'll go back to regular bench mm -hmm. press because it's a bilateral movement. Yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, I, it took me a while to find that strategy because I was working with something new. So this is where trial and error comes in, as we talked about before. And you want to do it as kind of as safely as possible because you want your errors to be minimal. Like, Oh, I didn't perform as well this day versus I pop my titty. Right <laughs> there, those are two different results. So if you're conservative with your warm ups in the beginning, at least, and you slowly get more adventurous, then you might you might find that sweet spot where you perform your best. But if you, like you said, throw a plate on there and then jump to three fifteen, if you weren't ready for it, you you, you hurt yourself. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I have a good uh, personal anecdote for this uh, of kind of along the lines of what you were talking about is, uh, so what I mentioned before about ab work is uh, generally, especially when I'm doing like a push pull legs that I've been doing, I don't do abs the day before legs because I don't want to strain or fatigue them. I don't want to be feeling it the next day when I really need to focus on my form because of my posture, because of my hips. Well, I've built back up to a point where now that's a problem uh, because I was doing a deadlift pyramid the other day and on the drop sets, I could only make it back up to five reps. I couldn't do the eight and the 10 that I wanted to do to finish out because I could feel, I could feel it slipping. And this goes to one of your, the, the tenant of uh, a fitness that, that you added in of mindfulness. So mm -hmm. not only could I feel that my, my, my lumbar was straining, so that's important because I, I need to know, okay, this is my last set. I'm done. But I also felt that it was because I was losing it in my core that was causing that lumbar to sag. So now I know, okay, I need to start adding in more core work to my regular workouts. Now that's going to mean that I'm, I may have to scale back some of my leg work. I may have to do other things, you know, more body weight circuit type things that aren't going to put a load and a stress on my back so that I can keep working, but also build that core strength back up. Well, and, and again, not all work is equal. Uh, some things you can do daily just to reinforce a good pattern in your body. Like, mm -hmm. I'm going to stick with the plank. Plank is a great postural exercise because you're not in pelvic tilt. You're you're stabilizing your core, your low back's in a neutral position. If you're doing it right, your shoulders are in good posture. It, it's, it's, it's overused by some, but at the same time, it's, it is one of the staples of what kind of underlies a lot of programming and, and you can do it in a lot of different ways and we can get fancy about it, which I do because it's fun, but the, the bare bones of it is that position is really great for your body. So if you incorporate that every day into some something, I mean, again, again, we can get fancy with it. What is a push-up other than a dynamic plank, right? What is a rollout? You're you're doing planks at the end of the the thing with your arms extended. You can do all kinds of little things, uh, warm up stuff, a bear crawl. You're in essence holding a plank if you hold it for long enough. So. All of these little things that stimulate you in the same way, we can reinforce daily and we should be, but also in our warmups, part of my dynamic warmup is the hand walkout, right? The, what people call inchworms or caterpillars, mm -hmm. where you walk out to a plank position and then you walk your feet up. 
right there, right there. And then I'm already activating those abdominal muscles. But uh, as far as warming up for your big lifts and then ab work after warming up for your big lifts, volume can accumulate over time. So this is, uh, we might not be talking about the same Cressy thing, but this is from Cressy as well, way back early in my training days is he uses his warmups to increase the volume for his training. Mm. So, so say we're doing three by one, you know, we're doing three, two, one plus or something. Well, that's not a whole lot of volume. Right. Uh, so that's only basically, if you have the weight exactly right, that's only six reps, but you're working up to that first three, you can incorporate volume into that by doing plate another quarter. Say you're, he, he does like 600 pounds. Well, how, mm. how many warm up sets are you doing? If you go, if you go 135, 185, 225, 275, 315, 365, we keep going and going and going and going and going until you get to that 600 pounds. And if you do it with the right rep range, then you're not wearing yourself out and you're incorporating volume into your program while you're warming up properly and, and actually setting yourself up for success. And that's not even far off from a max out warm up where you would do 10, 5, 2, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, until you get to your max. You don't go straight from the 10, 5, 2 to what you think your max is. You do an easy one, a moderate one, a semi-high moderate one, and then you go for a good number, and then you try for something you've never done. That's that's realistically how a max goes. That's how they do it in the competitions too. They come out there and they pull the thing they know they can pull on the you know on, on the first pull. Mm -hmm. So they don't have a failed lift. So they can add it to their total. But then they started adve going adventurous after that. The, yeah, we're we're getting fancy and back into back when you talked uh, first talked about uh, program density. That that's where uh, I have gotten to where when people ask me questions, unless it is you know a very basic you know kind of yes or no thing, I tend to say it's complicated. Mm -hmm. How much time do you have? You know, for instance. Somebody asked me the other day, oh, you're a trainer. What's your favorite lift or what's the best lift? And I had to say, it's complicated. Mm -hmm. For me, it's the deadlift because you're engaging pretty much everything except your pecs and even a little bit there. But it's basically a total body workout. And I need the posterior chain work. And I've done so much posterior chain work in order to get myself back in shape in order to rehab my spine that I know that I can do, like if, if I don't have a lot of time for anything else, I can do a deadlift pyramid. I'll get quality work in and I probably won't hurt myself. And it probably translates to most things you do in real life more than anything else, because mm -hmm. we're always picking shit up. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, again, it, like you said, it's complicated because it's like, well, ask me what my favorite five are. If I was stuck in a place where I could only do five, what would they be? You know, something along those lines, because the deadlift doesn't get, give you anything on a single leg. And we've seen from your knee evaluation, you mm -hmm. suck when you get on mm -hmm. one leg, right? So maybe a one-legged squat or a one-legged deadlift might be better. We don't know. The The answer is yes. I, I made yeah. this comment at the end of last night's, which, uh, uh, for those that aren't paying attention to all this, I'll just make it again. I'm kind of like a methods hoarder. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not that I, I don't discard any of these. It's just sometimes they sit there for a long time, but they're always there so I can use it if I need it. And mm -hmm. you always justify hoarding because you use that one thing that time. My wife gets pissed because I save all the old bits of wood when I do a project around the house. And then every once in a while, I put something together out of those old bits. And I'm like, see, that's why we keep them. And I've got the big giant bag of screws and I've got all of that stuff. So, yeah, I've got a couple of, of shelves holding uh, equipment that I made out of my scrap pile. Uh, but back to the abs, again, intensity is key. So if I'm doing like an upper lower split, usually I'll have a squat day and I'll have a deadlift day. I do consider deadlifts a lower body exercise. And those are also my most intense ab days because they're the farthest from the next time I do something like that. But I still do abs on the other days, but it's kind of like a reinforcing good motor patterns thing. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I do that too with certain neck things like shrugs. 
um, I know I need them. They aggravate my neck, but there's a risk reward there of uh, with, with some strength and a little bit of mass, it helps stabilize my neck. So I know I need it. So I do it on my day before my day off because I know I'm going to have, I'm going to have, I'm going to have a day where I'm just going to ice and do mobility and stuff. So I have extra time before I lift again. All right. A little bit more. Good. Yeah. And then we can dive into your stuff. <laughs> a jump right to 135. It's very likely your body won't be ready for this. But if you try to warm up at 25s, it's going to look and feel embarrassingly heavy. So go right for the plates. Bang out five to eight slow, controlled reps. Make it look intentional to mask the fact that it's actually kind of hard and you're struggling. <laughs> One set. Next part is super important. Start stretching and pretend to nurse a phantom injury to show people you're rehabbing, and this is why your squat is so pathetic. Make excuses. Is that Dr. Drew? Yes. You know, pretty tight today, man. Those hip flexes, you know. It's all war injury, actually. Yeah. War zone. Call of Duty. Sitting down all the time, man. Sitting super bad for you. You know that? <laughs> Sitting down is the number one cause of disease in men. I oh, mean, I used to hit like. Four or five plates easy back in high school, but you know, man, just getting old, body can't take it anymore. Abuse, you know, much safer to not like to squat, you know. But I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it a shot today. I think I'm gonna PR. Try to keep him talking long enough so that someone comes over and asks how many sets you have left. Now listen very carefully. No matter how many sets you have left, you will always tell them you have one more, and then it's all theirs. Then throw a couple quarters in this slot machine and go for broke. Then hit a top set of 185 for four and a half and stop before you actually break something. All right. Oh, time to bring it out. Oh, bring it out. Same thing, baby. Oh, hit my quad with fucking fire. Play right. That, that was terrifying. Because <laughs> I go to a box gym, so I see stupid stuff like that. I've never oh. seen that dumb, but I wouldn't be surprised if one day I saw it benches stacked on top of each other oh. remember you always just have one more set left <laughs> four and a half at 185 so you don't break yourself okay about starting at 135 it depends on how much you can squat mm -hmm. intensity is percentage of max it's not what is actually there so if, if you can squat you know, I always start at 135, but I'm working up to 300 or so. You know, it's not 135 does not feel that <laughs> heavy. Uh, I did go to a conference once, and this college strength coach had a big deal about never warming up under 50% max already because you'll just wear out your athletes. And I'm like, oh, all that told me was you, your athletes are out of shape but uh yeah i find that problematic i like to do a bar set with with almost everybody because sometimes it's grooving the motion it's it's just feeling squat a lot of times it's the first time they've squatted down for the whole day mm -hmm. you know especially if they come in in the morning well and, and like for me and i know i'm not the only one is when i get to the bottom of that first one i might need to kind of shift around yeah, adjust you sit my down stance. there and you feel you feel the good spot exactly mm -hmm. and I've just got the bar on, so I'm I'm not having to worry about that shifting causing a, a stress that's going to cause an injury. It's all right, all right. Now I'm good. Now I can push it back up, and I can I can do some more warm ups. Um, I do like the uh, the reason we like him is because there's like three layers of irony to his videos. Um, so there's there's part of it is he is being a character, but then there's actual information buried in there. Uh, and and uh. What gets me about the, you know, you, it's it's going to look and feel pathetic if you do a 25. It's, uh, yeah, I see a lot of that. If you go to a box gym, you're going to see that. You're, you, I, I'm constantly reminded, I wish I could remember who I first heard say this, form over ego. And there's a lot of ego there where that's, what you're doing is nonsense, but you think it looks impressive. And what would actually be impressive is going back to the beginning of his video is if you didn't have chicken legs.
and get made fun of by someone who thinks running half marathons is fitness. Let me pause real quick and then we'll go into the detail. All right, sorry for that hiccup. Needed a bathroom break, but this is the first thing I thought of. <laughs> Especially that haircut. It's everywhere now. And I, I don't know if oh no, Patrick Mahomes was the victim of it or he started it, but oh. Uh, I, uh, I hurt my ears yesterday because I had to really crank up my uh, my Aussie while I was doing doing my uh, my heavy pushes because I was I was at, I was at the end of the dumbbell line because I was using the heavy stuff and there were a bunch of high school like hardcore you know like people who don't understand that bro science is irony and there was a lot of bro science going on and like by by this one guy in particular who was just you know confident that he knew what he was talking about and he was coaching his friends and it was not good yeah they're young maybe he'll grow up to be competent maybe he'll still be an idiot we'll we'll find out with time we'll find out well let's go to Contreras, and we'll talk about the the rules and then i'll tell you how to break the rules uh mm -hmm, mm -hmm. hold on If I knew how to do technology, I would be more rich. Here we go. All right. During my first ever squat session, I hammered out sets with 95 pounds, 115, 135, like a boss. A week later, I was moving to 185. Within a month, I was busting out 225. And I still recall the feeling of my first set of 275. I proudly busted out five reps and my quads were on fire. Pretty soon, I'd be squatting three plates. Pretty impressive, right? Here's the crazy thing. In my mind, I was going deep, at least down to parallel. However, I was mortified to learn that what I thought were deep squats were, in fact, not even half squats, but more like quarter squats. Shortly after my big set with 275, something very memorable occurred. A gigantic mountain of a man walked up behind me and uttered 19 life-altering words. Why don't you drop down to 135 pounds and squat deep like a real man? I turned and looked at his way, but he didn't even look in my direction or alter his gait. It was as if I was too insignificant to be worthy of eye contact. From behind, the dude looked like he could squat and deadlift a grand. In retrospect, I think it might have been Bill Kazmir, who's famous powerlifter, for those that don't know. Uh, bumbled around for a couple minutes, trying my hardest to justify sticking with the heavier loading. Lucky for me, in a rare moment of rational thinking at the age of 20, I decided to take the man's advice. I put my tail between my legs, stripped the plates off, and dropped the load to 135. I proceeded to perform three sets of deep squats. I felt muscles working in ways they'd never worked before. From here on out, I was a legitimate squatter. In the next year to come, my legs grew like crazy. I think my quads and adductors doubled in size. More vital to my long-term learning, though, is that I realized the importance of using a full range of motion and prioritize proper form over loading. Strength gains will come much faster if you... First, build a proper foundation of good form. So a friend sent that to me and said it reminded me of me. And I was like, yes, but. And. Yes, and. Yes, and. Yes, and. Uh, that is a good golden rule for most people. Except I work with real people. Brett Contreras was a 20-year-old kid that was doing his thing in the gym and he's also quite athletic to begin with so a big giant mountain of a man giving that advice to that 20 year old obviously athletic looking young man was not a big deal but you give that same advice to someone who's been sitting in an office chair for 30 years and can barely reach down and touch their toes that's an injury waiting to happen so that's that's one and okay so know your audience yes as a young 20 year old kid he needed the ego bust but at the same time there's more than one way to skin a cat as well and uh sometimes you work up to a good working weight and then start working the weight the the, the range of motion after or you do both consecutively using different motions or in some cases i even find that sometimes i have to just do two different exercises 
like, okay, they can only squat three quarters of the way. So we'll do, you know, some moderate weight squats, and then we'll do some range of motion work afterwards using the, the stripper squat with no weight. So you kind of have to break it up into two pieces. So there's, there's a big yes. And there, so it is a good, important lesson. And, and I know he's a public figure that, 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 that is pushing these things. And in a lot of cases, when you go, you go to a box gym more than I do, you see it every day. It is a big problem, but in my controlled environment, it's not a big problem. And I have to take into account everything else. That was the first. And sometimes people can't squat that deep and you're going to hurt them in the process. Do you want to add to that before I go to well, the second end? Go watch our squat video from a couple months back. That mm -hmm. that was one of the first things you did with me is stop squatting so deep because you, you, you're losing it. You can't. That's that's where you get the wobble. That's where your back starts to go. Control it down to parallel and then stop. Uh, so, and I've been doing that. I've been squatting over a bench and now I can take the bench away and I only have to put the bench back there if I'm doing drop sets or going real heavy. So the second and is what's your goal? And sometimes it's actually beneficial to limit the range of motion because I can accomplish a goal better with having that high force, high load with a limited range of motion. A good example is doing Anderson squats with our baseball players. Well, yes, we squat deep doing our general prep and doing our tissue work, with like his legs grew, his leg, uh, you know, Brett Contreras talked about his legs growing, right? So we're, we're doing our tissue work, getting that full, long range of motion, damages the muscle more, causes the stimulus to, gr to grow more muscle, uh, the stimulus uh, hormonal reaction to grow more muscle. But at the same time, I'm working with an athlete who's going to generate most of his force from the power position, which is basically a quarter squat. And so I can do what we call Anderson squats, where you put the, the, the bar on a peg where they're in a quarter squat and they explode up. Well, now I can safely, very safely overload my athlete at a high speed. Whereas if I try to do that with a full range of motion squat, we're look, we're, it's a recipe for hurting yourself. Mm -hmm. So we can separate those two things. We can do our tissue work. But when I'm looking for that burst of power, burst of speed, I can limit their range of motion. Same thing with the, the pin press, which is basically the bench press version of that. I set the weight up on the safeties. They get in this position and they go boom and they explode up. Almost impossible to hurt yourself from there because I can load that bar as much as I want. And if it's too much, it just doesn't move. There's no eccentric loading. There's no... Uh -huh getting into that deep stretch of the muscle. So all they're doing is generating force. Boom. Almost impossible to hurt yourself. And I'm working something that's going to benefit them uh, in the long run in their sport. But you're also getting benefits from that in normal situations. You're still getting some tendon uh, force loading. You're still getting bone density, flexion and loading. You're getting all, so we can't put ourselves in a box of bodybuilding. And even right. if we do, there's benefits to that because you can work in a safe range and then work the range as you, as you go. Mm -hmm. Or you can have chemical assistance. Well, yeah. <laughs> One of my favorite memes, nothing stronger than love except Roddy Coleman. He can squat 800, 800 pounds. That's <laughs> It's good Light depth weight. too. Lightweight. Light yeah, he weight. did. He, he did. He did have good depth, but he's bodybuilding. Yes, for this long mm -hmm. body of the muscle uh, tissue development, that is the best way. But there's there's so many other uses for limited range of motion as well, or you can use it to get through a plateau. And this is this is it was really fun timing because I had just started this thing with myself that I had plateaued doing full range deadlifts as I came back from, from this injury and I, I plateaued pretty much where I left off at 415, 425 ish. And the, the standard loading protocols weren't helping me very much anymore. So, okay. So you got to try something different. And so what I started doing was 
it, it was the feeling of the heaviness, the feeling of just all that load in your hands at that time that was throwing me off. It might've been mental. It might've been something else. So, well, you can get used to that and then increase the range of motion. So I started doing rack pulls and rack pulls are where you set the weights up again, similar to that Anderson squat or that mm -hmm. pin press, you set the weight up, you started a limited range of motion. I started at mid thigh and you pull the weight and then you set it back on the rack. So you, you don't have that deep eccentric loading. The rack's always there to save you. And if worst case scenario, if it's too heavy, you just can't lift it. Now I'm concerned about my bars. So they're, they're technically rated for 800 pounds, but I stopped <laughs> at 600 because I mean, it's really cool because it's like bent over, but at the same time, I don't want to push the integrity of my bar until I have to buy a new one. Cause bars that are rated for that much weight are super expensive, but I started at 600 and I started at, at just above mid thigh. And I've worked down and I'm pulling from about nine inches now, which for those that, uh, for the ladies in the audience, the difference between five inches and nine inches is pretty, pretty substantial. <laughs> if you've ever come across nine inches, the numbers say you better, you, you've got a good body count or you're really lucky if you have, but the, uh, but yeah, I'm still doing great work. If I'm pulling, you know, 600 pounds at a foot, that's the same mechanical work as pulling 300 pounds from the, the ground, which is about two feet of work. It's the same mechanical work and you're getting a different stimulus. So if I keep working that down and I can get down to the ground, it's this, it's, it's progressive overload. So you can, you, this is how you break the rules. The, the, <laughs> the, the general rule is do the full thing proper form, right? But then if you plateau or you've got a special audience or a training consideration of your own, that's when you follow the Arnold advice and you break the rules, but you got to know the rules before you can break. Exactly. Them. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that, that is why you have to learn the rules and not just what they are, but why they are, because why knowing are, the yeah. why is what's going to help you break them properly. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of boning, uh, this is one of my favorite videos and this is when I became a big fan of Contreras and this is way back this is like yeah nine years old uh and first of all it's funny because he pulls out a skeleton model to demonstrate butt wink and he starts the video off apologizing that it's not super anatomically correct because it doesn't move very well yeah very which dark. is actually i was looking to to <laughs> buy one and uh to get one where the spine and everything moves really well is about $2,800 different than getting the one he's got there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So he's talking about butt wink here. When you go down in a squat, you want to keep this arch like this. And you don't want the pelvis to rotate too much. Now, here's the thing about theory and working in the field. Um, when, when I squat, um, I can come down. I get to about right here, and this is where I start to lose my tilt. From here, I can keep this nice solid arch. When I go deeper, I start to lose it. So that last few inches of range of motion is where I lose my solid lumbar extension and my anterior pelvic tilt. However, it's not it's not a problem. I can squat like this month, week in, week out, month in, month out, year in, year out, and it doesn't cause a problem because it's not too much lumbar flexion. It's not too much posterior pelvic tilt. So I get so many emails where people say, well, Brett, you know, first of all, how, how do I know if I'm having too much butt wink or too much posterior pelvic tilt or lumbar flexion at the bottom of the squat? Does your back hurt? That's, the, <laughs> that's how you know. Because you just, as a coach, I've seen it for so many years, you just know. There are some guys I've seen, the worst case, was a guy in uh, Auckland that I that I used to train with. He would get to about, I'd say, when he squatted, he would get to about right here, and he would start to lose his, he wouldn't even be close to parallel, and he would start to round. And Okay, so the that's enough of the, the point is, you know, he he's being nuanced there. 
-hmm. didn't just say, you know, clickbait, butt wink, cure your butt wink with this one easy step. It's, it's complicated. Yeah. Well, and, yeah. and again, it's, it's starting with what you have and then slowly feeling your way out. So let me give you kind of a long-term programming model. Uh, if you're doing it kind of a three phase system where it's high rep, moderate rep strength work, then you work as much range of motion as you can during the high rep because it's low weight, right? High rep. And then you try to continue that in the moderate weight and you adjust their load. But then when you get to the strength, you, you go with the gains you got, right? So if I got them from 60 to 80 degrees on that squat, well, then we try to see how heavy we can get at 80 degrees. I'm not going to force, you know, below parallel to that person that wasn't able to do it even a lot at a lighter weight, but then when we're, we're going to repeat the cycle. So now I know I can get them to 80 degrees during that next high rep. I'm going to try to get to parallel, which would be 90 degrees. So now we can work down to 90 degrees and then try to continue that and then try to continue that into the strength work and see how heavy we can get at 90 degrees. So you pick and choose your battles and I'm going to pick my range of motion battle when, when they're, they're, they're not as heavily loaded. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to go with what I gained when I get to the others, the, the other phases of the game. And the, the butt wink thing is just one of the considerations as, as an observer, what you're looking for, but realistically you want them to come out and be like, I'm sore, but I'm not in pain. Yeah. And I, again, that's, that's why I brought up your, your cue of mindfulness. That's why it's so important is, you know, if you have a good personal trainer and it really is personal because they know you, the person, then they should be able to tell when you are exerting yourself properly, when you're straining, when you're not working hard enough. If you don't, oh, you gotta, you gotta learn your client's O face. Mm -hmm. And, and, and if you, if you don't have someone to do that for you, then you've got to learn to feel it for yourself. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and good communication too. So, uh, okay. Was that a good, uh, or was that, I hurt myself. Uh, some people, it sounds exactly the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I'm I'm usually watching the movement because you'll there's just something and it's not something I can describe. There's just something about the way the movement happens that, you know, OK, this is too much. Let's take off a little bit of weight or, you know, ah, you can do a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Well, and there's some clients like the one I just finished with that we've been working together long enough that I actually determine their load by how they warm up. Like, uh he, he he can he can bench press a, a Buick, so he's he's pretty strong. We'll do the 135, then we'll do the 185 standard, 225, and then if it's a heavy under five rep lifting day, I'll I'll jump him to 275. And what how he looks at 275 is where I determine where we end up. So it's actually very organic in that manner. I already know if I'm going to do two, three, four, five reps, but if he looks good at two two seventy five, then we'll end up at three thirty five. If he's struggling at that two seventy five, maybe I'll make it a three oh five day. And so we kind of dynamically work it. U UConn, I don't know if they still do it with their athletic department, but they used to. They did a vertical jump at the beginning of every training session, mm. and your load was determined by how close to your max you were on that vertical jump, and. Now that's a gameable system because if you know that system, then you would you could dog a jump if you don't want to work hard that day. But uh, I'm sure they got something to get around that. But maybe make it more miserable if you don't lift heavy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, you got lots of conditioning <laughs> or something like that. So yeah, yeah, you know maybe that keeps it from being gamed. But yeah, if you're if you're close to your your vertical rep max, then you're also going to going to be close to your one RM on your on your lifts. So it's uh it's a decent it's it's an organic system and it's something we can do in one on one and you can kind of learn to do for yourself but it, it it's it's this is where the art comes in to the training yeah the science says but the art is is well, so, something we've ranted about before on uh, <clears throat> other subjects is you know Dr. Drew's 
uh, uh, complaint of this is why it's called practicing medicine. And why aren't we being allowed to practice medicine anymore? Because the human body is incredibly complicated and you have so many variables, you know, to, to, to your example, you know, maybe he didn't sleep well the night before. So that's what I was just going to say. We're only that's doing the biggest one. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't know how you slept the night before. I don't know if you've been in a, you know, unless it's a situation where I'm, we're managing your diet. I don't know if you've been in a calorie deficit for five days in a row mm -hmm. you, or you, yep. yeah, you forgot to eat breakfast. If you're normally a breakfast eater or, or I'm a very, case, I, yeah, I'm a very angry driver. And so when I have a crappy commute to my doctor, it's, Oh, your blood pressure is high today. Yep. <laughs> it's, May, and and I also tense up. So maybe you had a crappy commute, and now you're all tense, and you're having trouble moving. There, there's just so many variables uh, that you have to kind of feel your way through certain things. All right, well, I think that's a good place to leave it, and I've mm -hmm. got to run, and I think you do too, anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, so we will we will see y'all next time with more uh, Wheel of Time. Back to the Lord of Chaos. Yeah, uh, but we do need to get more on the social stuff, too. I mean, the name of the channel is Social Distillation. Uh, mm -hmm. And and so we got we got we got good, good COVID news, especially with some Sweden comparisons and excess deaths oh, yeah, and yeah. things like that, which it actually is if you're red team, there's good and bad. Uh, if you you're no team, then it's all good because more information is always better. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you're blue team, it's pretty much all bad. But uh <laughs> yikes yikes so we'll we'll get back on that uh anything else before we leave see y'all next time see y'all next time